In this lecture, I am going to discuss on gear kinematics and in the subsequent lecture, we are going to use the, the kinematic relations that we obtain here in understanding gear trains. So, I will first introduce uh, gears and gear kinematics, then I will discuss the universal law of gearing action, then I will show you how to calculate the transmission ratios both the transmission ratio for motion as well as the transmission ratio for torques. So, what is a gear? A gear is a toothed element used for transmitting rotary motion between shafts. Now, shafts can be parallel or skewed. Usually, we use gears for constant transmission ratio, but there are very special applications. Uh, which we are of course, not going to discuss where you can have periodically varying transmission ratios. A gear uses higher con pair contact which means that these are either line contacts or point contacts. Here I show you some uh, pictures of typical gears. This is called the straight tooth spur gear, this is the helical tooth gear. If this is the gear axis, then the teeth are on helixes centered uh, around the center line of the shaft. So, these are helical gears. A double helical gear is a herringbone gear. You can see that these have uh, these are helical gears, two helical gears put together, these are herringbone gears. Now, this set of gears are used to connect two parallel shafts. In the next set, we have the spiral bevel, the meter and the straight tooth bevel gears. These are used to connect two non-parallel intersecting and sometimes non-intersecting shafts. Here, uh, in the in these examples, they are all intersecting shafts and they are at 90 degree, but it you can have uh, shafts intersecting at uh, uh, other angles as well. In the third row, I have some special kinds of gears, the planetary gear which we are going to discuss in detail in a subsequent lecture. We have this worm and worm wheel. This is the worm and this is the worm wheel. Now, this worm and worm wheel, this is uh, non reversible, which means that you can only rotate the worm and hence produce a rotation on the worm wheel. So, this is the input and the rotation of the wheel is the output. You cannot rotate the worm wheel and have a rotation of the worm. So, this is not back drivable. And finally, you have this rack and pinion. The rack can be considered to be a gear whose radius of uh, curvature is infinity and you have the pinion. So, this is the rack and the mating gear is the pinion. In the planetary gear, you have a pinion and this shows an internal gear, but you can have planetary gears with uh, two external gears as well. Let us now come to the kinematics of gearing action. The our discussion on kinematics will hinge on this very important concept of pitch curve. So, what is a pitch curve? Pitch curve is a theoretical curve which is fixed to a gear. Here there are two uh, meshing gears, therefore, there are two pitch curves. These curves are such that the relative motion of the gears are represented can be thought of as rolling of 
one pitch curve over the other. So, there is relative rolling without slipping of the two pitch curves. That represents the relative motion or relative rotation of the gears that are in mesh. So, it is very important to notice that pitch curve is a curve that, rep that undergoes pure rolling motion. So, the two pitch curves are in pure rolling motion with respect to one another and it represents the rotational motion of the gears in mesh. Let us consider uh, two gears in mesh and try to look at the transmission ratio. Let us try to understand transmission ratio, motion transmission ratio of two gears. Let us say that this gear 1 has n 1 teeth and gear 2 has n 2 teeth which I have shown here. Let us consider that in unit time, in unit time there are n teeth which come in contact in the contacting zone. So, in our uh, figure here, so this is our contacting zone. So, if I consider unit length of time, it could be second, it could be minute. Let me count the number of uh, teeth that are passing in through that contacting zone. Now, the, the because the, the, the teeth are in mesh for both gears, so equal number of teeth will pass through uh, this contacting zone. So, let that be n. So, if you have this, then the ang average angular speed of gear 1 can be expressed in this form. You can recognize that this part of the expression is nothing but the average, this is the angle. So, if there are n 1 teeth, suppose if I consider these as, as, as the teeth, then this angle is 2 pi over n 1. And similarly, this angle is 2 pi over n 2. Now, since n teeth pass per unit time, therefore, this expression gives us the average angular speed of gear 1 and this expression similarly gives us the average angular speed of gear 2. Therefore, the ratio of the average angular speeds is which is given by omega 1 by omega 2 average is minus of n 2 by n 1. Here you will notice that I have put in a negative sign to stress upon the fact that the rotations are opposite. This sign is very important when we, uh, when we consider multiple gears as we will see. However, this, this expression that we have just now derived is for the average angular speed, but the instantaneous angular speed ratio can fluctuate. So, we can have in general a term like this. So, omega 1 by omega 2 instantaneous is of course, minus n 2 by n 1 this is the average value plus there is a fluctuation which is denoted by this function t of t. So, this is a time varying fluctuating function with 0 mean. So, you have fluctuating component p t. Now, of course, as I have mentioned before that we would like to have constant transmission ratio. So, why? Why do we need constant transmission ratio? This is because if you have fluctuating transmission ratio, then you will have vibrations. You will have uh, whenever you have vibrations, which means force also will, will fluctuate. If there are fluctuating forces, so stresses will be fluctuating and therefore, the gear teeth etcetera the, and the shafts everything will be under uh, fatigue loading. So, because of fluctuating uh, loads being transmitted, the system will be will, will have fatigue 
So, the thing might fail by fatigue either the tooth or the, the, or the shaft and furthermore it will introduce noise in the system. All these things are undesirable for a gearing system. Therefore, we would like to have a constant transmission ratio. So, we have to understand how or under what conditions we can get constant transmission ratio. So, for that let us go back to our discussions on Aronhold Kennedy theorem which we have discussed before. Here I have a figure of two laminas which are hinged at O2 and O3. So, lamina 2 is hinged at O2 and lamina 3 is hinged at O3 and they are in contact and we considered that this is some kind of a transmission uh, between 2 and 3. Therefore, we expect that this contact will be maintained. This contact is to be maintained. Now, what is the what is the condition that this contact be maintained? The condition is the the relative normal velocity between the two bodies at C must vanish. So, they must have the same normal velocity. Let us look at how the Arnold Kennedy theorem helps us in getting at the relation or getting at the condition that must be satisfied in order uh, that, that the transmission ratio is constant. Now, let us recall what is Arnold Kennedy theorem. It states that if three bodies are in relative motion, then the relative ICs, the relative instantaneous centers of rotation of the three bodies, they are collinear, they, they, they lie on a single straight line. In this figure, this is the IC between the ground, I have numbered ground as 1. So, O2 represents the relative IC between 1 and 2, O3 represents the relative IC between 1 and 3. And then from the Aronhold Kennedy theorem, we must have the relative I C between uh, 2, 3, I 2, 3 on the line joining O 2 and O 3. This is what is the statement of Kennedy Aronhold theorem. Let us locate the line of the centers, which I have drawn here in black. Now, how to locate the relative I c I 2 3. Let us look at the common normal at the point of contact. So, this red line is the common normal at the point of contact. As I have mentioned that this common normal, so this is the point of contact, let us say c. Now, I can imagine C as a point belonging to 2 as well as C belonging to 3, body 3. So, this, these are coincident points. These are coincident points at this configuration. If the contact is to be maintained, then velocity of C 2 in the normal direction if this is the normal direction, then velocity of C 2 in the normal direction must be equal to velocity of C 3 in the normal direction. This is the condition of maintenance of contact between bodies 2 and 3. Okay. Now, how to find out these velocities? To do that, let us drop normals from O2 onto the common normal. So, this angle is 90 degree. Similarly, I will drop another normal from O3 onto N. So, I will drop another normal onto the common normal N. If my angular speed of body 2, if I call it omega 2 is in this direction, which means it is 
counterclockwise, then you realize that in order to maintain contact, body 3 must rotate in the clockwise direction. Now, let us look at the velocities, this is what we want to find out, velocity of C 2 along the normal and velocity of C 3 along the common normal. If you look at uh, these, these uh, constructions, then velocity of C 2 along the normal, let me draw it in blue, is same as the velocity of point m in this direction. We have, this we have discussed that because of, uh, because this body 3 is rigid, therefore velocity of m along the common normal, which is along the common, common normal n is same as the velocity of C 3. So, this is the velocity of C 3 along the normal. So, let me write that. So, this is velocity of C 3 along the normal. Similarly, velocity of C 2 along the common normal is this. So, this is velocity of C 2 along the common normal and this you will find is same as this velocity of n, velocity of n along the uh, normal. So, velocity of n is exactly the velocity of n because I have dropped n as a perpendicular from O 2. Then I can write velocity of C 2 in direction n is nothing but O 2 n times omega 2 and velocity of C 3 along n must be O 3 m times omega 3. And these two must be equal. Therefore, I can write omega 2 O 2 n as omega 3 O 3 m. Now, I will introduce that sign as we have discussed because as you can see omega 2 and omega 3 are in opposing so, this is omega 3 which is clockwise and omega 2 is counterclockwise. So, to introduce that direction I, I will introduce this sign. Therefore, omega 2 by omega 3 is nothing but minus of O 3 m by O 2 n at this instant. So, whatever is the configuration, the ratio omega 2 by omega 3 is minus of O 3 m by O 2 n. Now, if you observe these two triangles, the triangle O 3 m p and triangle O 2 n p So, if you observe these two triangles, then this angle is same as this angle and the other angle is 90 degree. Therefore, these two triangles are similar. So, triangle O 3 M P is similar to triangle O 2 N P. Therefore, I can write O 3 M by O 2 N equal to O 3 P 
by O 2 P. So, from similarity I can write this which means that in our ratio of omega 2 by omega 3 we can write this as minus of O 3 P by O 2 P. Now, what this tells us is that if omega 2 by omega 3 is to be a constant then this ratio O 3 by O 2 P must be a constant and that can happen only when P is a fixed point on the line of centers. O, so, omega 2 by omega 3 is a constant if P is a fixed point on the line of centers. This is because the distance O 2 O 3 is fixed. So, if P is a fixed point on the line of centers then the ratio omega 2 by omega 3 is a constant. This is a very important conclusion that we have drawn and this thing this statement is known as the fundamental law of gearing action. So, let me bring in that statement now. So, fundamental law of gearing states that the line of action. So, this common normal m n is called the line of action. So, fundamental law of gearing states that the line of action m n must pass through a fixed point p which is known as the pitch point on the line of centers for a constant transmission ratio. This is the fundamental law of gearing action. So, p must be a fixed point for constant transmission ratio. Note that it says that p should be a fixed point. It places no constraint on the orientation of this line. As this uh, these laminas move the line possibly can change, but it should pass through a single point. Then the transmission ratio is a constant. So, that is guaranteed, but this uh, rotating uh, line of action as it is known as uh, if it rotates then there are other problems that we are going to discuss. Now, why this is called the line of action? You see this line of action is the common normal at the point of contact. So, this is the point of contact. So, line of action is the common normal through the point of contact. If I neglect friction then the force then the force that is being transmitted is along this line. The force is transmitted along the common normal. If friction is negligible then this is the major force contribution. So, that is why it is called the line of action and P the point through which uh, the, the, the line of action intersects uh, or passes through on, on, the, on the line of centers this point P is known as the pitch point. Now, let us get back to the concept of pitch curve and see what is the pitch curve. As I have mentioned that the pitch curve is the curve which is fixed to a gear and the motion of the gear is kind of relative uh, rolling of one pitch curve on the other. Now, if you then consider ask this question what is then the pitch curve. So, pitch curve is the locus of this point P, locus of this point P on either body 2 or on body 3. If you consider the locus of P as seen from a, an observer as seen by an observer on body 2, then 
then you get the pitch curve of body 2 and if you look at the locus of p sitting on body 3, then you get the pitch curve corresponding to body 3. And because the, the, the pitch point p at the, at the pitch point p, this is the instantaneous center of rotation of body 2 and 3, which means it is as if body 2 is rolling about this point with respect to body 3 and body 3 is also rolling with respect to body 2 uh, with respect to, uh, with respect to body 2 uh, at this point. So, this is the point of rolling of the 2. Therefore, these are the curves which are rolling at uh, with a contact at p. So, these are the pitch curves. So, locus of p as seen by an observer fixed to body 2 is the pitch curve of, uh, of, of gear 2 or body 2 and similarly pitch curve of uh, body 3 is uh, the locus of p as seen by an observer fixed to body 3. Now, what happens if p is a fixed point on the line of action? Then the locus is a circle. Why? Because the distance of p from O2 remains fixed. So, the locus of p is a circle with center at O2. Similarly, the locus of p as seen on body 3 is a circle. So, this is the pitch curve which is now called the pitch circle for body 2. This is the pitch circle of body 3 and it is a relative rolling of these two pitch circles. Rela rolling, I, uh, th this rolling is of course, I mean this is pure rolling. So, which means there is no slip. So, this is the pure rolling between the pitch circles that uh, represents the uh, motion of the two meshing gears. Now, let us look at the the line of action. As I was mentioning, this line of action is the line along which the force is getting transmitted. We define something called a pressure angle, this is the angle made by this line of action with the common tangent at the through the, the, the pitch point. So, this angle usually denoted by phi is known as the pressure angle. Now, why this pressure angle? Because the force is acting uh, along this, uh, this uh, line and the angle made by, by this line, the line of action with the common tangent, which is the pressure angle, therefore denotes the, the inclination of the direction of force with the common tangent. Now, if this line rotates, it may be passing through a single point, but if it rotates, which means that the force direction is changing. If force direction changes, once again we have all those problems, stresses will be fluctuating, uh, again we will have vibrations, we will have fatigue failure. So, it is ideally we would like that not only it passes, the, the line of action passes through a single point, the pitch, the pitch point, but it also maintains a constant angle, constant pressure angle. Now, let us look at uh, some examples with with uh, these as the pitch circles. This is a, a notation that we will be consistently using. If you look at these uh, meshing gears, this is, this represents a gear. If this is a shaft and if I have a cross here, it means that the gear is fixed to the shaft. On the other hand, if I have a gear in a shaft and I indicate like this, the, which means that it is freely rolling, it is not fixed to the shaft, it can rotate with respect to the shaft. With this uh, nomenclature, let us look at the transmission ratio. Now, because the, the pitch curves are circles. So, omega 1 by omega 2 is minus n 2 by n 1, which we have derived already. There is no fluctuating component. The transmission ratio is perfectly constant, is minus n 2 by n 1. And 
from velocity matching at the point at the pitch point, this is the point of contact of the two pitch circles, the pitch point, it is you can also write it as minus of r p 2 by r p 1. Essentially, this is nothing but the velocity matching uh, omega 1 times r p 1 is nothing but the velocity this velocity and that must be equal to omega 2 times r p 2 will bring in that negative sign to indicate the direction. So, these two must be equal. So, from here I have this relation. Now, we can also have meshing uh, a, a gear meshing with an internal gear. In that case, this gear is known as a ring gear. Now, here you see that the directions of rotation omega 1 and omega 2 they have to be the same because the velocity for both the, the external gear and the ring gear this must match at this point of contact. Now, this is the pitch point. Now, how do we understand this in terms of the, the example that we, we have considered before? If you consider two lamina, this is the line of centers and if you look at the common normal it intersects outside the, the, the two instantaneous centers, these two instantaneous centers, these centers of these two, these two gears. Now, once this goes outside, so this is the pitch point, then you will notice that if this is rotating in a counterclockwise sense, this also has to rotate in a counterclockwise sense to maintain contact. So, if the pitch point is not within the, the, the two centers of the gears, then we have this situation where we have a ring gear with an external gear. So, this is our uh, notation for indicating a ring gear fixed to a shaft. Now, we have omega 1 by omega 2 as n 2 by n 1. So, we have positive sign here because omega 1 and omega 2 are in the same direction and that can also be related to the pitch circle radii r p 2 by r p 1. Let us look at the torque transmission from the principle of virtual work and from power balance. Here we have used the power balance. You can write the rate of work done at gear 1 plus rate of work done at gear 2 considering this as the system that must vanish, which means that tau 2, this tau 2 is the torque that is uh, acting on, on gear 2. So, that can be related to torque on gear 1 from this relation above and since omega 1 by omega 2 is minus of n 2 by n 1. So, finally, we have this as the torque transmission and that can also be related in terms of the pitch circle radii. So, let me uh, summarize what we have discussed. I have introduced uh, gear kinematics in terms of the, the pitch curve which uh, uh, we have found how to determine pitch curve and if we want constant transmission ratio then we need the universal law of gearing action or fundamental law of gearing action and we have discussed the transmission ratios both for motion transmission and torque transmission. So, with that I will close this lecture.